This is a production of Cornell University. All righty. Thanks, everyone, and thank you for the lovely introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here speaking with everybody today. Um, I joined uh, Plant Sciences back in spring of 2020. You can imagine that's not a time when it was super easy to get to know many of you, although there's some familiar friendly places in the room, so glad to see you here. So I was really excited for this opportunity to share with you some of the research work that I've been doing at Cornell, not just here in SIPS, but also during my time in entomology. For those of you who are um, hemp team buddies, there will certainly be a little bit of hemp at the end, but you'll have to hold through while we talk about a whole bunch of other specialty crops here in the Finger Lakes region. So although I joined SIPS in 2020, I first came to Cornell back in 2011 to do my PhD with Greg Loeb up here in the top in entomology at the Agritech campus in Geneva, New York. I also had the opportunity to work really closely with Brian Danforth and members of his lab here to develop molecular tools and use phylogenies to understand patterns and agroecosystems, and also to work really closely with Dr. Katia Poveda here on the Ithaca campus. And when I finished my PhD, I transitioned into a postdoc in her lab before joining you all here in the School of Integrative Plant Sciences as a SIPS-wide senior lecturer. So during that time, um, I also had the luck to work with more than 60 different farmer collaborators all across the Finger Lakes region of New York, without whom none of the work that I'm gonna present to you in the next 40 minutes or so would have been possible. A lot of the motivation for the kinds of questions I ask is around creating uh, solutions that growers have that balance agricultural productivity with conservation of biodiversity on working land. So this work would really not have been possible without them. And I'm incredibly grateful to their mentorship and advice and guidance and welcoming me onto their farms to do this kind of work. So as my title alluded to, uh, one of the primary drivers of biodiversity loss worldwide is land use change, the transition of natural habitats towards agricultural uses, which results not only in an overall loss of the amount of available habitat, but also in a fragmentation of the remaining natural habitats that are left distributed across these agroecosystems. So in terms of species, that can influence their ability to disperse or to colonize or persist in these natural habitats. And when we add that up across many species, that influences the overall composition of communities in agroecosystems. So as we move from landscapes that have more diverse mixes of land use to those that tend to be more dominated by agriculture, we lose a few essential resources that can help to support beneficial insects that can be promoting ecosystem services. So we often see that a transition from more naturally dominated landscapes or mixed use landscapes to ones that are more simple is associated with a reduction in things like floral resources, which means a loss of important pollen and nectar resources for beneficial insects like bees, as well as parasitoid wasps, alternative hosts and prey at times when pests may not be prevalent within cropping systems, are very essential for supporting beneficial insects like natural enemies of crop pests. We also lose important refuge habitats. So that could be refuge from things like pesticide applications, but it could also be things like harvest or tillage, some of those big disturbances that are associated with agricultural habitats. And of course, also a loss of important overwintering habitats that allow these populations to persist. And so overall, these changes in the landscape result not only potentially in a loss of important species within these ecosystems, but also the key ecosystem services that they provide. We know that wild bees, for example, are much more abundant and provide better pollination services on farms with landscapes that have high cover of natural habitat in the surrounding landscape. We also know that natural enemies of our crop pests 
tend to be more abundant, more diverse, and have higher levels of activity against pests in landscapes that have a higher level of natural habitat. So there's been a few studies that have documented these in crop systems all over the world, mostly looking at really highly agriculturally intensive landscapes. So when I came here back in 2011, I wanted to understand whether these patterns were also impacting growers here in our relatively diverse mixed use Finger Lakes region in New York State. And I started working on this question using strawberries as a focal crop system to answer these questions. So many of you are probably much more familiar with strawberry systems than entomology groups that I tend to give this talk to. But just in case, strawberries here in New York State are grown perennially. They are grown in a range of different kinds of production systems. So here in the middle, we have an example of matted row strawberries. These will flower and produce fruit generally in June. And um, in between, the rows are mulched with straw. But we're also seeing an increase in adoption by growers of plasticulture production, as well as day neutral strawberry plants. So for my initial work, I focused just on farms that were growing one cultivar, one of the most common ones in this region, Jewel. And they were all using this matted row style production. But the big key difference across all of our farm sites that you can see here around the Finger Lakes region is that we selected farms that span this gradient in the amount of natural habitat present surrounding that field site. So on the far example here, we have a relatively complex landscape. So we have lots of natural habitat interspersed with these agricultural fields. The fields themselves are kind of irregular in shape. There's lots of hedgerows or other linear habitats like that riparian buffer running through the fields. And the crops there are relatively diverse in terms of their composition. So there's a lot of opportunity for resources to occur spread across the distribution of that landscape that would facilitate the movement of beneficial insects from those natural habitats into the crop system. In contrast, some of our farms had much more simplified landscapes around their focal field. And so in this case, we have a farm that has almost entirely one other crop type around it. In this case, it was apples. Apples and strawberries are grown commonly together on the same farms here in this region. We have very little natural habitat and a lot of very regular structure to that habitat, not a lot of natural area remaining. So one of the first questions that we wanted to understand with this um, cultivar jewel that was being grown on farms here in the Finger Lakes is how much does it depend on things like wild pollinators in order to have a high level of crop productivity. So thinking about things like fruit sets, for example. And to do that, on each of the farms, we had plants that were bagged, which means they only were exposed to their own pollen, no pollen that was coming in from insect visitors. We call that our self-pollination treatment. We also had plants that were free and open to insect visitation and ones that had supplemental hand pollination added to those. And what we found across all of our farms is that there's some evidence that this variety jewel benefits from pollination services provided primarily by wild bees which we found more than 80 species across all of our farms, we see about a 40% increase in yield when we compare those self-pollinated fruits to fruits that were allowed to have insect visitation when they were flowering. However, if we compare those to our hand pollination treatment, we found that we still weren't able to achieve the full potential suggesting that a lot of these farms had pollen limitation. And when we break down this contrast, comparing open and hand across our sites, so in this plot, each one of these bars is an individual farm site, we see that just under half of our farms are experiencing significant pollen limitation. So that means the open pollinated fruits are much smaller than the hand pollinated fruits are across those sites. And when we look at those, the primary driver that we found to explain that difference is, of course, the number of bee visits to those flowers during the flowering period when we did transects in those fields. So sites that had very low levels of visitation had the greatest difference 
between their hand pollinated and their open pollinated fruit set, but that difference disappeared at the highest levels of bee visitation observed. Unfortunately, what we also found is in these relatively diverse wild bee dominated communities, they were lower, not only in abundance, but also in richness, a measure of diversity at the farms, at sites that were surrounded by high proportions of agriculture. So as we increase the amount of agricultural habitat at the one kilometer scale around each field, we see a decline in both the abundance and the richness of bees on that farm, suggesting that these farm sites are more likely than to suffer from pollen limitation. So how about for pest control then? To explore that question, we focused primarily on this one pest insect, the tarnished plant bug, Ligus linealaris. And our surveys found that this insect is causing as much as 40% crop damage across all of our farms on a given year. Fortunately, there is a complex of both native and introduced parasitoid wasps. In the 70s, the USDA uh, went to Europe, found the European tarnished plant bugs parasitoids and introduced them into the US to control this native pest insect. It was a fun time for classical biological control during that period. Subsequently, we saw uh, regional levels of tarnished plant bug populations decline, meaning that these insects were quite successful overall in controlling the pests. But these parasitoid wasps require a bunch of things like nectar in order to help them produce eggs that they then oviposit into the nymphs of our tarnished plant bugs, which are the ones that are causing damage on the strawberry fruits. So potentially sites that have more floral resources as well as more connectivity between those floral resources and our agricultural fields may potentially have higher levels of parasitism rates. And to detect those, we sampled nymphs from all of the fields across our range of sites. And we used some molecular tools to identify the DNA of the parasitoid wasps so we could determine which species had attacked the nymphs and the overall proportion parasitism at a site. So as soon as those uh, larvae that are inside of the developing nymphs reach a particular developmental stage, they erupt out of the nymph's body as a brand new wasp and that nymph perishes. What we found was that at very small spatial scales around our fields, higher levels of natural habitat were associated with an increase in parasitism rates. And the small spatial scale potentially makes some sense here because these are very tiny little parasitoid wasps. They're probably not moving very great distances across farm landscapes. In contrast, higher levels of natural habitat around farms at much larger spatial scales, double the scale, was associated with a reduction in tarnished plant bug abundance, which could be due to the parasitoid populations having a top-down effect where they're suppressing pest populations, but doesn't necessarily rule out that tarnished plant bugs also may be suppressed by other factors at the landscape scale. So it may be that having a higher diversity of different plants means that tarnished plant bugs are using those weedy resources may maybe more so than in the strawberry fields. Either way, summing up what we found in this first initial study was that farms that are surrounded by high proportions of agriculture with low amounts of natural habitat had fewer bees and overall greater likelihood of pollen limitation and less pest control. So what would a grower do? What are their options if they find themselves in one of these agriculturally intensive landscapes? One idea that's been proposed is to augment the resources that are available in these landscapes using things like wildflower plantings. There are two uh, programs sponsored by the federal government, the Conservation Reserve Program and the EQUIP program that will actually subsidize the establishment of these conservation plantings on farmer lands. And so it would be good to know how effective they are at potentially solving some of these problems by providing that refuge, floral resources, alternative hosts, and overwintering sites that could be absent. Not all good news though. 
because unfortunately, there was a proposed theory at the time that we undertook this study that suggested that the effectiveness of adding something like a wildflower strip, one of these agro environmental schemes, should depend on the landscape that you put it in. So on the far example here, in a cleared, highly agricultural landscape, if you establish a wildflower planting in the middle of one of these landscapes, you're not very likely to have an overall positive effect, either in terms of biodiversity conservation or potential benefits to ecosystem services. The reason for that is that this landscape is very unlikely to have a pool of beneficial insects that could move into your wildflower planting, be supported, and then spill back over into your crop. And in fact, if there are things like wild bees or natural enemies existing already in that landscape, they probably are pretty tolerant and will be able to persist in that landscape without this additional resource added. At the far end of things, in really complex landscapes, if we were to add a wildflower planting in the center of this landscape here, it would likely be a drop in the bucket in terms of the overall amount of resources that we are adding into that landscape. There's already a really diverse mix of different land uses present here, lots of natural habitat that facilitate that movement of beneficial insects across that natural crop boundary. So adding a wildflower resource strip here, not again gonna do very much to increase your overall amount of biodiversity or the services on your farm, but it's really this Goldilocks zone in the middle here where we have the, what we would call intermediate landscapes. And in fact, this hypothesis was termed the intermediate landscape hypothesis, which suggests that only in these landscapes where we have some amount of natural habitat, but adding resources in would meaningfully increase the availability of important resources for beneficial insects, and furthermore may influence their movement from natural habitat fragments into the crop habitat where they can potentially provide ecosystem services. So the time that we started out looking at this, this had just been proposed as a hypothesis. And so one of the studies that I wanted to undertake was to evaluate whether or not these wildflower strips would provide important services for growers, and also if there was some landscape context dependency to their services. Are we allowed to take questions? Do we? It's unusual, but you could do it if you want. <laughs> I'm happy to take a question. I'm curious about the sort of spatial scale of this, of the different types of landscapes you're on. Where does that make sense? I'm super glad you asked that. So for people who aren't always thinking about these landscape scale patterns, some of what I showed you before, is things that are at quite a small scale, so just 500 meters from the edge of a field, for example. And often it'll depend on what we know about how likely a, any particular organism is to travel or to be influenced by the other habitats around them. So often when we say landscape, we mean sort of like this amorphous thing that's dependent on the particular organisms that we are talking about. So there was no strict um, scale that was associated with this original hypothesis, but because we had done some earlier work and found that at least for biological pest control and for pollinators, that scales somewhere between 500 and one kilometer were seeming to be the most predictive of responses within our community. That's what we used for our study going forward. So we picked out 12 farms and on each of these farms, we established two experimental strawberry planting. So planted out plug plants in the first year. And at one of the plantings on each farm, we had a border row of native perennial wildflowers. We established these from plugs because it was a PhD and I left so many years to do that. Uh, growers would normally establish these from seed. And even then, it's quite expensive to establish one of these habitats, part of the reason why we have these large subsidy programs overall. So we put these in as plug plants. We worked with the plantsmen to collect local ecotypes of a lot of these plants and then get them established on our farms. We selected species that had a range of broad bloom times so that hopefully we would be able to support 
all of our beneficial insects across the entire span of a season here. And so when it came to our response variables, again, what we were looking for was crop visitation, as well as our biological pest control and yield. And in all cases, you're going to see a lot of plots that look like this. I'm going to walk you through them first. So we have the proportion of natural habitat here, and this is actually at the 750 meter scale, so it's intermediate between those two time points. And the points that will appear on here are going to represent the difference between our control site and our wildflower site. So any points that are above the stashed line means that wildflower plantings had more, in this case, more bee visitation than the control sites did. So I'll show you our data for bee visitation. And what we found, the first thing that pops out is this really nice example of what we were hoping to see, which is this curve showing effectiveness. Here, we actually had some sites at very low amounts of natural habitat that had fewer bees in a, their planting with wildflowers compared to our control sites, potentially indicating that our wildflower plantings may be competing with the crop for pollinators in landscapes where pollinator populations are overall relatively low. And it was only in this narrow range of about 35 to 55% natural habitat in the surrounding landscapes where we saw any benefit of having wildflower plantings for bee services overall. And even then, it took us three years to see those effects. So we established in year one, and then this is year two, three, and four of this study. So in the first two years, we really didn't see any benefit at all, independent of landscape context of adding in these wildflower plantings. And probably part of the reason for that is because we chose to use these perennial wildflowers. They took until this final year to really get going and get established and have a good stand establishment in that small wildflower plot. But it could also have been population level responses of our pollinator communities, which take multiple years. If there is a benefit in terms of increased resources in year one, that might mean that there's a higher level of bee larvae that are produced in that year, which then would emerge in the subsequent year. So it took us a while to see this context dependent benefit. In terms of our um, effect on pests, we really saw no benefit at all of planting these wildflower strips. In fact, we saw a cost associated with putting these in landscapes that had the fewest the lowest amount of natural habitat available. So in these landscapes, there were more pests at sites that had a wildflower planting, which is definitely not what we were hoping to see. And part of that may have to do with the specific biology of the pests that we're working with. Tarnished plant bug is not just a pest of strawberry. It's a pest of many other crops. It's a huge generalist. It will eat nearly anything that it can stick its proboscis into. And so in the last year of the study, we looked at all of the plants that were showing up in our wildflower margins, and we surveyed them for how many pests they were supporting versus how many of our pollinators they were contributing. And there was a few really important plants, especially those that are opportunistic weedy species, like this daisy fleabane up here, erigeron, that supported really high levels of tarnished plant bug with contributing basically nothing to promote beneficial insects. So management of these plantings and the plants that were in within the strips could actually have an important role in shifting that cost and balance. But at least in our study, we didn't find any benefits in terms of biological control. And so for yield, looking at uh, for example, fruit damage, we see that these landscapes over here that had the highest amount of pests also have the highest amount of damage. They have the, on average, the smallest fruits here. And there's only in terms of yield benefits, basically no benefit to adding a wildflower planting onto these farms. So this is kind of discouraging news since we had seen such a great effect in terms of our bee visitation response. So we were wondering whether this was true maybe in other crop systems. And to answer that question, I teamed up 
with Steve McCullough, you can see here, who was a PhD student at Virginia Tech and had just finished collecting a huge data set covering not just strawberry, but three other crops as well. And his design used um, this farm level analysis. So in this case, he had 22 farms spread all the way across the Eastern shore that included both Maryland and Virginia. Half of those farms, so the farms that have a triangle here were control farms. So unlike my study where I had two plots relatively close to each other on the same farm, he had entirely different farms. And in his farms that had a wildflower planting, he had a full size CRP or equip planting that he was working with. So potentially much bigger um, ability to detect true differences if indeed they do occur between sites that have these plantings and not. His sites also spanned a gradient in terms of the surrounding landscape complexity. And so what we decided to do is attack this data using something called a structural equation model. These kinds of statistical approaches allow us to capture the relatedness among multiple variables that we were collecting. So looking not only at the effect of these biodiversity practices, like conserving natural habitat around the farm or adding a wildflower planting into these intermediate variables here. So things like biological pest control or pollination, and then how they cascade down to affect important response variables like crop yield. And so in this case, we could see a direct effect if, for example, natural habitat increased the rate of pollination, which in turn was associated with an increase in the proportion of crop yield. That would be an indirect positive effect. But we might also see a direct effect, not going through this path, but just directly leading from natural habitat to marketable crop yield. If there was some other variable that we had not measured, or if the way that we measured these variables, for example, was not accurately reflecting their true impacts on crop yield. We did um, four different structural equation models, one for each one of these crops. So I'm showing you these here. You don't have to worry too much about following any of the lines. I will pull out the highlights for you. So the first in thinking back about our initial question about wildflower plantings, if we look here, and see the wildflower planting effect. And when these two lines meet, that means that there is an interaction. The effect of wildflowers on whichever response variable that they're leading to here is mediated by the landscape. And in several of our crops, we did find evidence that when wildflower strips had an effect, it was dependent on the landscape context. And in one case for strawberries, there was a direct positive effect where the wildflower plantings increase the level of damage from Drosophila suzukii, the spotted wing Drosophila in our strawberry plantings. So overall, the effects of wildflower plantings were fairly inconsistent across all crops. Some crops like collards, for example, had no effect of wildflower plantings at all. And when they were present, they were frequently landscape context dependent in ways that were not consistent even across the different pest groups that we were looking at. What did come out as fairly consistent across all four crops is either a direct or an indirect effect at nat of natural habitat on marketable crop yield. And in fact, across all four crops, we saw the most responses when we were looking at the amount of marketable crop yield, so grade one classification of the yield in any one of those four crops was much more sensitive to all of these variables and seemed consistently to have positive responses. Still not great news though for our farmers who find themselves in simplified agricultural landscapes. It again really looks like doing these conservation, small scale on farm conservation practices may not be the solution to that particular issue. So what could farmers actually do? They might choose to try to manage the crops that co-occur on their farm to try to support ecosystem services that are perhaps in the case of apple, a mass flowering crop that may draw in lots of pollinators, which could then spill over into later blooming strawberries. So we might use that distribution of different crops on a farm to try to use that 
as a way to supplement the resources that are available to insects on those farms. And that could, could be good, but it could also work against a grower. So for example, if we have strawberries blooming at the same time as a mass flowering crop like apple, apple has really large, very abundant flowers and may actually draw pollinators away. It may compete with strawberry for crop pollinators. But if we get the timing right, which is a variable that depends really strongly, not only on cultivar selection, but on weather patterns, which are becoming even more variable across years, we might see this relationship where apple blooms first and then strawberry comes online. And we could see a higher likelihood of facilitation where apple trees are supporting the pollinators that would then go on to visit strawberry. So that's what we decided to explore, whether or not that was true. And to do that, we first had to characterize the pollinator communities of both crops, which is what this network is here. So each one of these blue circles is a different wild bee species. The nodes here represent strawberries and apple, and all of these gold circles are the bee species that are shared between these two crops. So we have substantial overlap in the pollinator community and the size of the circle here is how abundant that bee is in both of those crops combined. So looking at that set of gold species, we can see that it makes up not only a lot of the overall species, but those that are most abundant between our two crops. So to answer our question about the timing of bloom and how that influences the likelihood for facilitation or competition, we again set out um, sentinel strawberry plants and we used bee bowls to sample our pollinator community on a series of farms all across the Finger Lakes region again. But we selected farms this time that had varying amounts of apple cover surrounding that strawberry field. And we put out our sampling arrays at early apple bloom, peak, and then in late apple bloom to measure how that overlap temporally in bloom would influence the dynamic. And then at each time that we were out, we did some surveys to look at the amount of apple bloom in the landscape. And what we found in terms of bee visitation, at least, is that early in apple bloom, there was a marginal negative effect of having higher cover and bloom of apple orchards surrounding the strawberry field on the number of bees that we collected in those bee bowls. That became much stronger and significant at peak apple bloom, but then started to turn upwards after apple bloom, supporting this idea that potentially having these overlapping bloom periods, having crops that are diverse across the landscape could potentially act as a way to support these beneficial insect communities. And this is not something that's just true for these uh, perennial crops, which honestly are very hard to shift in terms of flowering time, but could also be true for emerging crops like hemp. One of my undergraduate students, when I was in the Poveda lab, Nate Flicker, who's pictured here, was really interested in understanding the insect communities of an emerging crop in this region, hemp. And so he surveyed pollinator communities to try to characterize what bees were present there relative to the bees that were providing very important ecosystem services in other crops. One thing he noticed is that hemp is flowering at a point in the midsummer season when we have very few other floral resources available for bees. So even in natural habitats, there's very little floral resources in that June, July period. What he found is a relatively diverse bee community, not as quite as many bees as we would get in apple or strawberry, dominated by the honeybee, but also with 16 other species of wild bees, many of whom are actually very important pollinators of other specialty crops. So we drew studies that had surveyed bee communities from these other specialty crops in the region and looked at the overlap in the hemp bee community compared to these other specialty crops like apple or strawberry, which it shares about 25% of its overall pollinator community with, or even crops that are blooming at a similar time like tomato and also not providing any nectar resources. We mapped those out in a network thinking. 
And what you will hopefully see in a minute, there we go, is that all of those species, oops, too far. Well, anyways, all of the species that are present in hemp are all pollinators of other crops. There's no bees that are unique to hemp, meaning that it can potentially support really important pollinators of other crops in this region. But of course, it's not all good news. These crops might be supporting bees, but they are certainly also supporting pests. So if we want to think about using crop diversity as a way to promote beneficial insects, we also need to be really aware of all of these other pests that are located within that system. And so for the past two years, I've been working with Marion Zufel and New York State IPM to understand the pest insect community that's associated with hemp. Almost none of them are unique to hemp. Some of them are big pests of other specialty crops growing within this region. I've also been taking images of leaves to build a diagnostic library that growers can use to help identify different kinds of insect damage that are showing up in this crop, even when the insects themselves are not present. And um, my students have also been contributing to generating knowledge that growers can use. Um, the hemp production systems class that I teach every fall, Bill Miller came in and gave a great hands-on activity in that class where we evaluated different propagation methods. So looking at different substrates, different hormone treatments, different cultivars, how all of that influence rooting success, as well as the quality of those rooted cuttings and the students were actually able to not only set up this large experiment, but collect the data. And uh, two of the graduate students in that class have written that up to be included in our upcoming uh, New York State Hemp Production Manual that's led by my colleague at Harvest New York, Dr. Daniela Vergara. So I think I will leave it here um, and thank everyone, especially the folks on the hemp team who have welcomed me here for the past two years. And I will take some more questions. So we go to Geneva for questions first. You. Hi, um, Heather, great talk. Thank you so much. This was super informative. Um, I'm just, I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around this information. I, I visit a fair number of strawberry growers who are interested in uh, encouraging national natural pollination through planting wildflowers and it sounds like if they have that intermediate level of uh, habitat diversity then wildflowers would actually be helpful um for them but can you help me figure out how i would determine whether a habitat had like low intermediate high uh habitat diversity yeah so to evaluate that and maybe i'll repeat the question in case there's anybody you didn't hear, how do we actually evaluate landscape context when we're talking about making recommendations to growers? So if you think there's a grower who's excited about wildflower strips and you want to let them know, like, oh, you might be like, you're in the golden zone for making, for this will work, but you know, maybe not. I would actually say generally, even in the best landscape, I probably would not recommend planting wildflower plantings just because of the risk of spillover of those most important pests like ligus is so high we really didn't see an overall benefit in terms of yield and i think growers i would encourage them to think more broadly about other integrated pest management tools that they could use in controlling their pests that could benefit their bee populations or to conserve natural habitats or plant other crops that can provide resources that aren't as likely to be also a source of pest populations. But if they are excited about it and they're able to get a um, CRP or a quip subsidy to establish those on their farms and you want to let them know about the landscape, there is a um, site that's hosted by NAS called Cropscape where you can go in and look at the land use and land cover of any particular site. Um, there's also a new tool that will be coming online fairly soon called Beescape, which allows you to put in an address of a site and get an estimate of the amount of floral resources and it builds the buffers in for you. It does a lot of all that behind the scenes work that I would normally be doing in a GIS. So I can um, send you that, the information for that. Beescape. Thank you.
Yes. Um, I'm going to take a Ithaca question. Um, is there maybe students first? Uh, so do you think the uh, location or the way the design of a wildflower, meaning like a belt or a patch versus patch, would uh, affect the yield or if the best? Uh, yeah. So the question is about the placement. How does the placement of these plantings influence their overall costs or benefits to growers or benefits to biodiversity? And we chose to put them on the border of our um, small strawberry plots. And that was simply because that's the main way that growers seemed to be implementing those. Our plantings were quite small. So putting them into the middle of the crop, for example, wouldn't have really made an, a huge amount of difference. It would have been just a few meters and would have made it much more challenging to manage weeds within our crop system itself. But one thing I didn't talk about today, what I think it's really, really important to think about the spatial configuration of these wildflower plantings is that these are really artificial habitats that we are creating on farms. There's no natural area that would have this mix, even of native perennial wildflower plants that bloom continuously for the entire season. That's very artificial. And what we actually find is that when bees are visiting these wildflower plantings that have these ultra rich amount of floral resources that are blooming across the entire season, that they spread pathogens like wildfire in there. So we evaluated the bee community that was present in those fields and found that there was a very high level of pathogen prevalence. So I think actually, if I could redo this study, what I might do is think more about patchy distribution of those floral resources across the farm, not concentrating them all into just one region on the farm. But that reads like the pathogens on the bees or on Pathogens of the bees. So in particular for bees, one of the major drivers of pollinator population declines is the spread of emerging pathogens, often those that are associated with managed bees like honeybees, or managed bumblebee species. And those show up in much higher prevalence in a artificial wildflower planting than they would in an old field, for example. Yeah. I think kind of related to that, have you, do you know about research that um, covers woody species, like native woody species plantings, more of a hedgerow situation? Um, there's certainly a lot of benefits of hedgerows, especially in areas where there's a lot more thought about protecting and conserving riparian areas like California that have shown huge benefits of hedgerows for these same kinds of services, but they're not always the most practical for growers to establish or manage. And so we looked at these more herbaceous species, but certainly you could get equivalent, if not better levels of services from these more perennial habitats that are even less exposed to disturbance. Justine, did you have a question? Uh, my question was just, what was the photo on your title slide? Oh, that is an aerial image of Huelva, Spain, which is a fruit growing, like tree fruit growing region. It has these beautiful contour plantings. I spend a, way too much time looking at Google Earth of <laughs> random places. It was really good. Yeah. So did you look at the source of pollen when you did the soft pollinations? Was, was that self pollen from the strawberry variety itself? So we enclosed our um, plantings in this like tool mesh. So it could have been wind pollination coming from other cultivars that were present or you know, other dual plants that were present on the farm. When we did hand pollination, we hand collected anthers from primary jewel flowers and collected that pollen in the lab and then took it out to the field and paint brushed it onto our plants. But the self pollination as well as the open and actually even some of the pollen that came from hands because they weren't bagged certainly could have been from other cultivars. The reason I ask is there's some evidence in especially crops that pollen from a different variety actually yes. larger fruit. And that would actually show a greater impact of your pollinator than doing the hand pollen. Absolutely. So um, what Marvin was just offering is that there's been a 
I think maybe two or three studies now, especially for strawberry that have shown that when you have particular combinations of the pollinizer and the receiver cultivar, that you can get better fruit set from those combinations. And that was very likely at play in our system. We just weren't able to control for that in our study, but would be another reason potentially why diversifying at the farm scale, not just crops, but also cultivars could be beneficial in terms of the level of services. Yeah. Forgive me if I haven't uh, formulated this question very well, but um, when I look at, I guess, from an ecology standpoint, where we're lacking or where we're taking a lot of agricultural land from which biome would be like the plains, right? From Manitoba yep. all the way down to Kansas, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And as we take more and more away, we're losing more and more of that biodiversity, which I assume is probably a pretty big pollinator habitat. Um, have we crossed or do you foresee some sort of tipping point in which increasing acreage is only diminishing returns? Um, there has actually been a really nice study recently that was published on this, looking at where across the U.S. we're seeing the greatest transition of natural habitats towards agricultural areas, and it certainly is in the upper Midwest and Plains region overall. Most of the land that is being transitioned tends to be marginal in terms of its agricultural productivity. So we're not expected to get great gains from transitioning that habitat. And in fact, that is some of the habitat that is most critical for supporting um, groups of organisms, not just insects, but also things like prairie grouse, for example, that are known to be in decline. So one thing that I will say often us landscape ecologists use is primarily these linear models. We're not always looking for these threshold type effects where maybe everything is all great until we get beyond that 35% natural habitat cover threshold. And I think that is something that we'll probably start to see more of to understand what is the, the tipping point overall. Yeah. So talk about how there's kind of a Goldilocks zone where it's not too complex, not too simple, but is there research into what can be done to those areas that are so lacking that any transplant kind of wouldn't seem like be So I think there are, um, that's an area where managing the crop diversity probably has the highest level of potential. If you are a farmer that finds themselves in one of these more simplified agricultural landscapes, especially if you can't always control what's going on in the area around your farm, you can absolutely control what's happening within your farms. And I think there's actually a really great example of this here in the Finger Lakes, um, Elderberry Pond Farm, if any of you know that farm, they are situated in a relatively simple landscape. They are uh, just north of Canandaigua, I think. No, they're, they're in Auburn, sorry. They're just north of Auburn. Um, pretty simple corn, soy, wheat landscape around them, but they have invested over the long term, like the past 40 years, in developing all of these systems to manage their farms, not using, per se, things like wildflower plantings that help to support ecosystem services. And they have actually a, a really healthy and abundant bee population on that farm um, and relatively good biological control there as well. Okay, well, thank you. Well, we'll, we'll still be around if you want to um, uh, ask her any more questions. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.